We're into fuel efficiency of diesel truck engines. We're offering uh, manifolds and turbochargers and the ECM programming. We also make a wiring harness add-on. The main thing that Diesel Freak focuses on is trying to help make the owner-operator more profitable by burning less fuel. How about that Sanford truck in there? You got that radio on in there? I sure do, go ahead. Well, how are we doing this fine afternoon? Wonderful, how about yourself? Doing pretty good. Well, we're cruising here just outside of Tampa, just north of Tampa, Florida there, and uh, heading back up uh, toward the Wildwood area. Uh, who do I have the pleasure of talking to this afternoon? Well, you got Priscilla here, Chris. Tell me about what you're running there. Well, this is a 95 Pete, 475 Cat, hopped a little bit, uh, 13 over with 336 rears, 275 on the wheelbase, peaked out the upholstery on the inside, put suicide doors on it, and Classic One paint shop over there in Collins, Mississippi, done the paint job on it. Well, it certainly is a fine looking truck there, you know, from stem to stern, from front to back, it's a good looking truck. I sure appreciate it. What would you carry into Florida? I brought them a lot of honeydews. I uh, picked them up out of Nogales, Arizona and delivered them over here to Publix this morning. Well, 10 4 you're bringing that old fresh produce in. I see you're running a uh, reefer trailer there. Is frozen foods and produce what you normally haul? Yeah, that's basically what I haul. It's a 2001 Great Dane spread axle back there. Um, we do a little bit of cattle. We do hopper bottom and produce. Well, sounds like you'll stay busy no matter what then, huh? How long you been trucking for? <laughs> well, I started the 10th of January of 1978. What got you into trucking, if you don't mind me asking there? When I was a kid, listening to my dad leave the house and then listening to him come back to the house, you know, I was raised up on a farm, so, you know, we, he come and go, and um, I decided one night that that's what I wanted to do because I enjoyed the sound of him climbing that hill, and I I got off into it. Sound like uh, most folks there, they they get addicted to sounds. And hearing the sound of a diesel engine does something to you, and uh, I don't blame you one bit for wanting to climb into a truck and, and turn a time or two. Yes, yeah, sir. Well. I was the only girl out of all of us kids, uh, four brothers, and uh, of course I had to grow up as a tomboy, so you know, I'd get out there and I'd help my dad mess around with a truck and everything, and uh, I believe when I was younger, that when I'd get inside the cab of his old truck and clean it, I'd probably put more miles on his truck sitting in the yard than he did out there on the highway. <laughs> 10 4, that's a likely story. That's uh that's what most folks would want to do anyway, sit in the truck and pretend like they're running down the road. Oh yeah, I did a lot of it. And, um, yeah, like I said, I was raised up on the farm and um, when he'd come in, that was my getaway. I'd, I'd spend a lot of time in that old cab over Camelot of his and decided that I liked it and everything about it. And I, I've been a successful owner-operator and I just made a career out of it. Now, you, you said you, you grew up with four uh, four brothers there. Did you tell me where about you grew up there? No, I sure did. <laughs> uh, my mama had us up north, <laughs> way up north. And um, 
I slid down here when I was about 15 years old. I've been in the South ever since. Okay. So, where about was north? Just so we can get a point of reference, uh, where about was, was north, and then where'd you move and spend most of your time after that? Uh, Naples, Maine, Casco, Maine, up that way, and then um, moved down here to Alabama, and then got a place over here in Florida. I'm not going back, so don't try to talk me into it. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Well, well, tell me about who you got there in that passenger seat there. I will. This is my baby brother. Um, He's my world man, he's my best friend. He, he makes a trip with me every now and then and uh, gets behind the wheel once in a while and he's just great to have along with me. I really appreciate him being with me sometimes. Now tell me what it was like when you first started trucking. What what did you uh, end up getting yourself into uh, truck wise? Oh Lord, well I was uh, living in Virginia at the time and I was working on the docks down there loading and unloading trailers and I decided I wanted to drive, and old fella gave me a chance one day. He had a little old Transtar cab over in the National, had a little Detroit at 10 speed in it, and um, had a little old trailer. And he'd load that thing up, and I'd haul them peanuts and burn up sacks full of peanuts back to his place, and I'd just, just been on ever since. You said uh, with an uh, International Transtar there for one of the first trucks that you are running? Yeah, so that's right. That's exactly what it was. I've drove an old B model Mac, an R model Mac, uh, just pretty much about anything that's out here. So a lot of folks are going to go, all right, well, what's your preference? What do you, uh, what's your comfort zone when it comes to the trucks and uh, equipment types there? Well, I'm sitting in it right now, but uh, next in line would be the Superliner Mac. I love a Mac. I just, uh, all around tough truck and uh, they kind of hard to beat. Yes, you're right about that. You mentioned you picked up your freight out there in uh, Arizona. Is that the, the typical region that you run? Yes, yeah, sir, it is for me. Um, pretty much Arizona, back to the Carolinas, Florida, of course, uh, Georgia. Uh, we do have some runs that go up into Idaho and, and into Oregon. Uh, I pretty much am a dirty, dirty south runner. But, uh, we have a couple of drivers that are pretty dedicated running up that way. If you had the chance to, to talk directly to a motorist driving alongside you, uh, what would be something that you would you know share with them in order to stay safe as they drive past you? You know, that, that's, uh, that could take forever to talk about, but I would really like to see them understand that the size that we are, the magnitude that we have going on here, that you know, it takes us a little while to get our speed built back up and, you know, to slow down, it takes us a good distance. I would love to be able to get one of them up in here just to see what we see from up here and that they disappear when they get beside of us. They don't realize that. They just absolutely disappear in our blind spots and they want to tailgate back there and, you know, sometimes equipment fall, you know, it fails. I mean, you might blow a tire or something like that and I've, I've seen it do a lot of damage. But uh, they just need to be patient and really try to give us the courtesy and the respect to let us do what we got to do and get out of their way. Yeah, that's that's a good statement there, there as well. And uh, your perspectives are right on target and you might be able to speak directly to uh, a certain part of this audience as well. Now, running the, the, the type of equipment that you run, right now you're running a reefer. If somebody came up to you and, and said, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing what you're doing, you know, what's hard about it? what's easy about it what would you share with them about transitioning into running a reefer trailer oh lord well i know a lot of these schools if you'll have uh they're, they're running them in and running them out and they really don't know what's going on with what's happening out here um the reefer trailer i think would probably be a good start for somebody wanting to start out because you know most of their load is is uh, put on and, and is taken off by a forklift or something like that, you know, but uh, to haul cattle or, or a tanker or something like that, I wouldn't advise it, you know, unless they've got somebody that has the patience to really sit there hour after hour and explain to them and teach them how to do it. Then, you know, you can't just get into it and just go with it, you know. They used to, you know, that's how we was taught. Get in, sit down, fire it up and ride, but... 
I don't know, this generation today has just got a way different outlook on everything, and it gets a lot of people killed and hurt. Yeah, you make a good point about the way that most folks learn to drive. It was a learn on the fly type of situation, learn on the job type of situation. Going back to what you said about the freight being put on and taken off of the forklift, uh, it's not that easy, is it? Nothing in life is easy unless you have the patience and, and the time to accept someone that's been there and done it to teach you. I mean, if they're wanting to do it there and they'll take the time to listen to somebody that's been there and done it, they can learn it. It's it's not that hard to do. It's just a big safety issue. I mean, you can run yourself over and, you know, run somebody else over. But, I mean, it's just part of the job. It, a lot of common sense will carry you a long way. Now, if... Uh somebody comes up to you and they say Priscilla you know to be specific they they'll come up and they say you know their another woman comes up to you there and they say I've been thinking about trucking you know what would you want to share with uh, another woman that's thinking about getting into a seat of a truck there what, what would you share with them with, uh, with the history that you've had first thing I, I, I'm always going to be honest with whoever wants any information and if I know it I'm going to share it with them um, you know that there's a lot of a lot of things you miss in life when you sit behind this wheel because you're devoted and dedicated to, to taking care of the public and um, that's with any load, not just produce, but um, I would encourage them, you know, to really do their schoolwork. You know, would you be willing to be gone when your daughter has her first child, your first grandchild, or, you know, are, are you going to allow yourself to be subjected to some of the, the ugliness that's out here? Can you deal with it? You know, I mean, it's, you have to be pretty well-rounded and all the way around to, to, to deal with what goes on out here. It's, it's not as easy as people think. You don't just sit behind this wheel and do nothing. It, there's a lot involved with it. You make a good point about potentially missing some of the greater parts of life and the highlights and things that people would not ever want to miss. And I think that uh, someone would either have to have a, a certain situation, a personal situation, which, which will allow them to do that or, or a great family you know, backing them. With you and in your career, how did you handle that? Well... It's been a lot of heartache, you know, I mean, I've, I've missed a lot of family functions. Um, I've had a very understanding and supportive family and, and my friends, you know, and um, it's like my mom, you know, she walks out to the fence now when I get ready to leave and, you know, she says, I wish you didn't have to go no more, I miss you, and, you know, my destination is when I leave that house, it's getting back to that house, that's my destination to my family, and, you know, it's, it's tough. It, it gets tough. It takes about the first 100, 200 miles to really get my mojo going to, to keep getting in that direction. But, um, you know, I always wondered if I'm out there, you know, if something was to happen to my family, you know, or my mom or anybody, you know, how would I get there quick enough, you know? Well, hey, I fly, yes, but when, you, when you're a few thousand miles away from your folks and something bad happens, it, it's pretty devastating. So, I don't know. I, I, I guess maybe because I've been out here for so long, I'm, I'm ready to really kind of kick back and retire here shortly, but if somebody's wanting to get into it, I would, you know, ask them to sincerely, really, do your schoolwork, make sure you can deal with this, you know, because it's got to be in your heart and soul to do this and be just dedicated to it. I've seen, personally, some people start, and they're all, all gung-ho, and a month or two down the road, they're looking for something else to do. You know, no knock against them, but they, they see what, what's involved. Whereas some people, they, they know it's gonna be tough, but they, uh, they kind of rally and, and they, they get into it. You know, like you said, a couple hundred miles to get into it. That's telling me right there, it's not a hop in the truck and go situation. No, folks, yeah, it's a hell of a life. I ain't no joke. I mean, it, it is, and it's hard. It's a hard life. You know, we make the best out of it the best way we can, and we take the good and the bad with all of it. You have to. But I'm going to tell you something. I've tried two or three times to quit and go do something else, and I've come right back to it. It's just where my passion is. 10-4, you're not the first to say that there. I know. 
Well, I told my dad, we was all sitting at the t table one night, he said, so what you want to be when you grow up? I said, truck driver. Woo. He told me, no, you ain't. He tried to discourage me and everything, and I was like, no, no, no. You know, that's what I'm going to be. And uh, I remember the first time I actually had my first truck, and I drove it home and pulled up in his yard. The look on his face is still priceless, but, you know, I made it a point to do this, and... and I really enjoy doing what I'm doing, Chris, and I've actually, through the years, um, there's been several people out here that I've helped, that uh, I've tried to encourage them and, and different things that I've experienced, and uh, I mean, I'm here, I'm here for anybody. If they want to ask me something, if I know it, I don't mind sharing with them. I'm sure a lot of folks would uh, appreciate that, and uh, well, thank you for that. Sometimes those questions come through in the, in the in the form of a comment on these videos, and I try to think about some things that people would want to know uh, because of the comments that they have left before. But you've shared a lot, especially when it comes to determination and and what it's like to, to really be out there and you know live your life on the road, you know, as they say. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, Chris, the one thing that I've seen through all the years that I've been out here is a loss of respect. And, um, it hurts. You know, there's just so many ugly folks out here in a hurry to go. You know, we're all going either east, west, north, or south, you know, but everybody's got to be in a hurry. And I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's just an unfriendly bunch that's out here anymore, and uh, it, it really breaks my heart to see it. You're right about that there. But for the folks that uh, that are out there, there's a lot of good guys left and a lot of good uh, look, good truckers out there that are fighting to retain that good name that uh, that trucking once had, or that trucking still has, but not most folks see it. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir, you're right about that. I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I have a lot of wonderful, wonderful people that I've met out here through the years, and uh, I would trade their friendship for nothing. And there's... Uh, I don't know, there's a bond, you know, uh, there's a bond with us, and hell, I don't ever meet a stranger. Everywhere I go, I act like a jackass everywhere I go, and I try to make people laugh and, and try to make the trip a little easier, and that's just the way I am, you know, it, it makes it better. You know, um, I, back there when I was unloaded at Publix, I was telling you about the lady driver that backed in beside me out of Mississippi. Um, she goes by Turtle on the radio. And we was talking and everything, and uh, she said she was wanting to buy a truck. And she asked me what I thought about it, and I, <laughs> I said, well, you know, I, I done it because I was told I couldn't do it, but I wanted to do it to prove to myself uh, that I could do it and get it done. And um, she said, well, she said, I'm not sure where I want to start. And I told her, you know, just keep doing what you're doing the rest of the year. Just Take your time and check things out. And uh, she talked to me about when I first started. I was terrified. I ain't going to lie to you. I was scared to death. Couldn't keep it hardly between the lines in that old trans star. But uh, I think she's going to be okay. She's actually pushing that rig by herself. And, you know, my hat's off to anybody out here. But for the women that are coming out here and pushing these rigs and doing what we do, um, you know, I spent 33 years with my better half doing this. And, uh, I uh, lost him three years ago, and I've been pushing it by myself ever since. And it's, it's been times when it's, it's broke me down. I ain't going to lie, it's broke me down, but I keep pushing forward. And I, like I said, I've got a lot of friends out here that keep supporting me and keeping me going in the right direction with everything. Yeah, again, it takes a special kind to do that. And uh, you mentioned your better half there. Were you running team with, with him? Yes, sir. Uh, we ran together, when I first met him, we ran together, oh, up until about 98, 99, and we started buying trucks, and uh, we named our trucking company after the song, Alabama, She and I, and uh, that was our company name, She and I Trucking. Um, most of the time we was together, we was chasing each other, and um, uh, he was my mentor, he taught me what I know. So, yeah, it's been, uh, I took on both sides, both roles after we lost him, and it's, I didn't realize how much I leaned on him for a lot of things, but 
hey, I mean, he told me pay attention, girl, because I won't be here one day, and he was right. And um, everything he said to me has come to me, so I'm just blessed that he was where he was at with me. Uh, oh, well, that's such a special person and uh, such a special thing to have uh, to be able to you know, think back and recall. It may seem inconsequential at the time, but you know, I'm sure there's a reason something was being said, you know, for the reason it was being said. Oh yeah, man, he was, uh, he was my hero, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, I'll throw a question at you. Uh, a lot of guys want to know how to go from being a company driver to being an uh, owner-operator. They want to know how to make that transition. So what would you say to a guy who, who was thinking about going in that direction? Uh... Well, I, I really don't know how to answer that. I mean, I, it, you, you have to first, you have to find, come on over there. You have to find, you know, the type of equipment you want. You have to find the kind of a uh, cargo you want to haul. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer, and if you buy a truck and then you got to lease it on somewhere, you've done lost right out the gate. You know, you get your own authority. Do your own thing, um, you know, get you some brokers or whatever you need to do. Or, but if you, if you get a truck and you lease on, that's what I tell them. If you lease it on somewhere, you know, you've done lost your battle right there. So uh, I try to encourage them to get their own authority. Stay away from leasing their equipment. Um, I don't know, like I said, just really doing their schoolwork and checking everything out before they get off into it. You know somebody's going to say, well, you know, what does she mean by you lost right out of the gate after uh, buying a truck and leasing it on? You know, explain what you mean by that. Okay. Yeah, it's like uh, when, when you buy your, your truck, your equipment, uh, you've got your monthly payments, uh, insurance, overhead, repairs, all that, you know, it all figures in your insurance and everything else. Um, and if you're leased on with a company, and not all companies, I'm sure there's some really good companies out there, but for the most part, um, these big sister companies, they want to take a percentage of what you're making. Um, you still pay for your tag and your insurance and everything through them. And you're, you're obligated to them. They, they, that's your truck, but it belongs to them. You have to go and do what they tell you to do. And if you have a repair and they, they try to help you with it, then there again, you're obligated to them. And if you don't make that obligation, then, you know, it's just rough. I, I just, I wouldn't encourage nobody to do it. When I bought my first truck, I actually leased it, and it was a mistake. It was just horrible, and they treated me like a dog and told me that my equipment belonged to them, and I would do exactly what they wanted me to do it and when, and wanted me out four, five, six weeks at a time. I'm just not going to do that. The one thing that's always special about this job right here is the smiles that you put on people's faces around Christmas and different holidays. and. You know, it's like when the hurricanes came through, um, I, I donated all my equipment to the cause for bringing in ice and water and what have you, and um, you know, that's that's just an awesome feeling, knowing that you, you've helped somebody get through something like that. That's a great thing that you did by donating your, uh, your equipment and time and everything. But the irony in that is that, and I could be wrong, but it seems that that's when trucks, all of a sudden, the mind in the eyes of the average person, that's when a truck is, is or becomes important. When, uh, when something is needed, uh, you know, I'd hate for there to be a catastrophe or something like that. But it, it would be great that trucks and the people in the trucks were that important all the time. You know, like you mentioned, holidays and Christmas and whatnot. But regardless of the facts, you know, there's folks like you that are going to climb in that truck and get the job done no matter what. That's why I said we become everybody's mama and daddies when there's a disaster that takes place. And we don't do it because we have to, we do it because we love to do it. That's that's our calling, that's what we do. And after it's over we get treated like low bottom scum again and, and don't nobody like us. I, I don't get it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of those things. Some people have expressed, you know, a lot of thanks, a lot of gratitude for these videos that I make. It's, uh, I consider it to be a, a starting place 
for, for people to realize who really are behind these trucks. You know, I never did ask you uh, what you go by on the radio there. I call me noise maker. <laughs> I got a hoot. <laughs> Ten four. I noticed there that uh, you got some flags flying there on the back of your trailer. Uh, are you normally running there with the flags there? Uh, no, sir. On different occasions I run the flags back there. The POW flag is uh, my husband. Uh, he was a veteran. And, uh, I run the, the POW flag for him, and that uh, American flag uh, actually flew on top of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., and while my husband was fighting his cancer, a friend of ours, Arvin West, um, obtained the flag and the certificate and, and, and um, mailed it to my husband. It was a great honor. Well, I would certainly uh, have to agree with that. Uh, being able to have that uh, flag there and knowing what it represents and being able to put it there on the, on the back of your trailer there and run it when you want to, that's certainly a good thing. I'm sure a lot of other guys would uh, appreciate uh, seeing that there waving in the wind there. Yes, sir. Uh, I've had a lot of waves and a lot of hawks from their eyes and people with thumbs up. Judging by the camera on the inside, it looks like you don't picked up another passenger there. That looks like a old... Uh, William Sieben there from uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, I sure have. He's sitting over here grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with him. I can't get him to drive. Well, I'm going to ask you a question there when it comes to uh, safety and things. And while we were uh, swapping passengers, I noticed that uh, you carry a little bit of uh, protection there right there by your uh, your driver window looks uh what do you what do you got there uh, yeah, yeah sir uh, that belonged to my husband that's a uh, old timer broke knife uh keep it close by should i need it and um i have other protection on board as well um, i'm licensed and permitted so I, I i pack heat with me everywhere i go just because of the places that i have to get to for safety well, i don't blame you one bit about that some folks they don't realize how exactly dangerous trucking is and the guys that are out there, the guys and girls out there, they already know how dangerous it is. If you don't mind sharing, what are some of the things, uh, other things that you do, you know, to keep yourself safe as you go into these different places? Well, I usually try to get there in the daylight hours if possible. It don't always work that way, so no matter what time of the day or night, I, I usually try to keep the inside of my cab dark and uh, when I was going to New York, I'd pull my hair in a ponytail and put it up under a baseball cap and sit low in the chair so that they couldn't tell that it was a female in the truck. Um, I also um, look in the shadows. You know, I look for the ordinary. If I can't see if there's something going on, then it, it kind of jumps out pretty quick. Uh, you just have to really use your common sense everywhere you go. Every turn, every shadow could be something dangerous to you. You just have to watch it. I've heard a term that a lot of people use, uh, keeping your head on a swivel, uh, being aware of your surroundings. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, I, I actually had a, a really bad experience up in New York one time coming out of Hunts Point. 
Uh, I got away from there and stopped to check my unit. And I felt like I was in a safe place. There was a few cars sitting out there in another truck, a big truck. And Anyway, long story short, I was uh, mugged and I was beat up there that night. Uh, uh, ever since then, you know, it's like anybody that rides with me, you know, I make sure I'm not just taking care of myself, I'm looking out for them as well. But you have to not be paranoid or anything like that, but you have to acknowledge that the way this world has gone today, that there's a lot of dangers out there. There are people out there just praying to wait to see somebody out there. And, hey, it don't matter if you've got a dollar or if you've got a hundred dollars. They want it, they're going to take it. Yeah, I agree with you there. So uh, I'm going to throw it over to William there. Uh, you've had a, a few minutes to ride there in the truck. Uh, you got any questions there you'd want to ask uh, old noisemaker there? the main issues you run into as a woman in a man's world? Um, started out pretty rough. Um, you know, women are supposed to be home, barefooted, pregnant, cooking and cleaning. Uh, you know, it don't always work that way anymore. You know, it takes two to make the world go anymore. Uh, I know from experience that after I lost my husband, I had to play both sides and I still get some ribbon from some guys out here but not many. Uh, it's just part of life. You just let it roll off your shoulders, you know? Well, I think you're doing a, a darn fine job. You know, obviously if you weren't, you wouldn't have been uh, out here as long as you have been. So I appreciate you for, uh, for doing that and I'm sure uh, you said uh, your mom and your brother they appreciate you as well. You're out here doing this for, for them as well. Yeah, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Come on in now. You know, my mom used to ride with me. I'd pick her up at the house and we'd go down to South Florida down here in Orlando. And she was a champ. She'd sit over there and she'd ride. I'd tell her to go lay down. No, she's going to sit right here. She said she wanted to see what my world was like. And um, she got it first hand and she has a different outlook on my job and, and she understands more now why I do what I do and the reason I'm gone as much as I'm gone and she may not like it but she respects it and she backs me up 100% in it. Well that's that's great that she does that. She does that. You mentioned that your brother, Buddy, he, uh, he rides with you and he drives. Uh, are your other brothers into trucking? No sir. Uh, my oldest brother um, passed away. He drove a truck. Uh, the other two brothers, they do roofing and construction work and stuff like that. Well, I'm sure they appreciate you doing what you do and being out here and, you know, sticking to it. Uh, you know, these folks that I work for, they they couldn't have ended my life at a better time. Uh, they, they took me on and they've been awesome to me and my family. Uh, just can't say enough about the Sanfords. Uh, Mr. McDaniel, he's my broker. He keeps me loaded. He's top shelf as far as I'm concerned. they hard working people and uh, I told them if they ever shut the doors or anything they're going to have me out there in the ditch knocking fence posts or something. I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to leave them. They've been too good to me. I think the world of them. It's great that you have uh, those folks behind you. Now I'm going to throw another question at you. It has to do with safety. We just passed a car on the side of the road there and I ask a lot of the guys when I can about the, uh, the move over law. What have you observed about cars and their behaviors of not moving over when they should? Chris, it's sad. It really is. It's, uh, it's not just the cars anymore. I see a lot of truck drivers that just refuse to move over. Um, it's like one night I was out there in Albuquerque, New Mexico on the hill out there, and I had to knock the short shaft out of this truck. It was, it was I almost said about 35, 38 degrees out that night, and it was it was cold. The wind was blowing. I couldn't get no one to stop and help me. Um, I got under that truck and was taking that short shaft out, and the truck drivers would not move over. I mean, we're, we're talking at 1.32 o'clock in the morning. They wouldn't move over. And, you know, laying up under that truck, I realized, uh, hey, I'm not afraid to do it. My job, it was, uh, I realized that how massive this equipment is, and if somebody just 
doses or just hits me, you know, I, I've got nowhere to go. I'm going to be tangled up in this. I don't even have a fighting chance. Uh, it's, it's just really sad that people don't have no respect. They're in too big a hurry and I don't know, they're, they're driving blind. And I guarantee you if somebody's been broken down on the side of the road and, and, and felt what you just uh, described, I'm sure the next time they're driving somewhere, that's going to come to mind, and they uh, they may give, give a little more leeway. They may give a little more, uh, they may move over, basically, you know. Hey, you know, this is something that people need to look at. How many times have you seen a big truck pass a pickup truck pulling a camper, and when they get right beside them, the force that surrounds, the wind that surrounds these trucks is, is unbelievable. So when they pass those campers, they kind of make them drift on the road a little bit. It's the same effect with anything that's there. That funnel of wind back there, it can suck you up in there, and I, they just need to move over. They need to slow down and move over and give everybody a fair chance at what's going on out there and have some respect for everybody. And you know, uh, I don't know why I've never told this story before, but it just came to mind. You know, I guess when you mentioned the, the thing about campers and, you know, truck, you know, pickup trucks and campers, you know, my family, we grew up going, uh, going to North Florida. You know, my family would go and uh, take the station wagon and a, and a camper and we'd find a, a campground. We'd have a good old time, but on the way back, we'd come back down 19, and this was probably in the mid-80s. You know, a truck came by in the left lane, and, you know, my parents, they, it wasn't their first time doing this or driving or what have you, but, you know, a truck came by and, you know, the mom was behind the wheel there, and, you know, that wind just pushed her out, and she went, you know, tried to correct, and before you know it, you know, the, the trailer was laying on the side of the road, and uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was a total wreck. You know, the, the, the station wagon was fine, we were fine, but the camper laid over on its side and, you know, broke open. It's one of those situations where you look at that and go, well, what in the world happened? Was it that darn truck? You know, I never blame the truck for that, you know, but it's just the, the force of things and how that force can affect other things. I really try my best to move over for everything and anything I see on the side of the road. And when we do that, some of these people don't realize what we're doing. They get mad and they speed up and they cut us off. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe everybody needs to go back and, and regroup again because it's just like hammer down is all they got on their mind. You got that right. And sticking them in a truck for uh, about a thousand miles or so uh, may give them a diff different perspective as well. That's right. I see you uh, headed toward the old Wildwood truck stop there. You know, after you get, you know, fueled up and everything, and uh, what's uh, what's next on the agenda? Where do you see yourself heading to? Sure, when I get fueled up, get me something to eat, me and my brother, we going to the barn. And Priscilla, it's been more than a pleasure talking with you. You know, thanks for making the time to talk about what you do and how you do it. I really appreciate it. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. It really has meeting y'all out here. And one on one, get to talk with y'all, and, and uh, I, 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 it's an honor. It truly is. And I, and I thank you for everything that you do out here and the effort that you're making to get the word out to everybody about this industry. It, it means a lot to me. It's my pleasure, and I'd be more than happy to do it with uh, with anybody on the road. Uh, coming through the area. It's uh, just the beginning of uh, letting the public know what uh, our drivers are doing out there on the road. Um, I appreciate you. I sure do. I've enjoyed this.
<laughs> that camera's off. Thank you very much.